Hello, everyone, and welcome to Towards Open Science Talks. My name is Cameron Rudell, and I will serve as your host today, where our primary focus is to uncover insights and innovations in virtual trainings. I think it goes without saying that we have seen a near exponential rise in virtual trainings over the past few years that impacts students and instructors across the globe. And I'm sure that many of us have attended virtual training sessions with varied success. And so we want to use today's panel to figure out how we can all deliver more effective virtual trainings. And to help us uncover the do's and the don'ts of virtual trainings, we have four experienced individuals across varied disciplines that we are excited to introduce to you. Before I share who those individuals are, I want to remind everyone in our audience of a few key items. We have a Q&A widget, so if you are joining us in the audience, please feel free to submit your questions using this widget. I should also note that this call will be recorded, edited, and posted online. And as a consequence, please be conscious of the information and the questions that you may ask to ensure you're not accidentally sharing anything that's privileged or requires any form of clearance. Additionally, as you all know, the NASA Towards Open Science Initiative TOPS is a growing community, and we would like to stay in touch with each of you. If you'd like to be kept up to date with our community events, please sign up for a mailing list, which you can find on our website, opensciencetraining.org. With that being said, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists for today, starting with Brian Nosp. Brian is a scientific applications software engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. He is currently the NASA Transform to Open Science co-lead of the JPL TOPS team, which is focused on Open Science 101 trainings and reaching out to historically underrepresented communities. When he's not championing open science, Brasso works for several NASA Earth science missions and projects. Brian. Can you share with us a little bit about your experience with virtual training and how you got involved in this field? Sure. So about a year or so ago, I was uh, I selected to be the co-lead of the JPL TOPS team, and we were focused on developing Open Science 101, a five-module course on open science. And we have been making that available online at in-person trainings. And we haven't quite started virtual training yet, but you know, given that JPL has a lot of remote employees at our center and we'll be reaching out to communities, I, I would expect that to begin you know, in the near future. Excellent, Brian. Well, it is a pleasure to have a fellow TOPS champion here. Let's go ahead and move to our next panelist, Dr. Jessica Formoso. Jessica is a cognitive psychologist from the University of Buenos Aires and a tenured researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council in Argentina. She specializes in the development of cog in, sorry, in the development of cognitive abilities. Since 2022, Jessica has been a dedicated member of Meta Docencia, currently serving as the impact measurement coordinator and instructor. Jessica, can you share with us a little bit about your experience with virtual training and how you got involved in this field in the first place? Uh, well, I've uh, been teaching for 14 years in person, and at some point I had to translate that to virtual training, and I realized it's not the same, and there are not enough uh, training opportunities, opportunities, sorry, especially in Spanish. And that's how I met Metal Sensi, and Metal Sensi has been doing this since 2020. Um, and in 2023, we um, were awarded a grant from NASA to contextualize the mater materials of Open Science 101 into Spanish and to teach uh, cohort virtual cohorts in Spanish. Fantastic, Jessica. Well, it's very awesome to have someone who contextualizes a lot of this information for us. So we, it's a pleasure to have you join us on this panel. Next up, we are also joined by Kenji Nomura. Kenji is a high school STEM teacher currently serving as an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educa Educator Fellow at NASA in the Science Activation Program. He has a passion for math education and is devoted to developing positive math experience for learners of all ages. In his role as a fellow, he has served as a co-lead of a data fluency action group, which has recently served as a TOPS learning community for SciAct. 
And so Kenji, the same question to you, can you share with us a little bit more about your experience with virtual training and how you got involved with your field? Sure, yes. Uh, so as you said, I'm a um, high school STEM teacher. So um, I started teaching uh, about seven years ago or eight years ago now. Um, and so I taught through COVID and so um, quickly had to adapt to uh, virtual learning environments. And so I really took to um, some different aspects of that and thought it was really interesting, um, some of the capabilities of it. And so uh, when I started this fellowship and I was working with NASA, there was a group specifically devoted towards data fluency, which is a passion of mine uh, with math. I really love teaching statistics and I think uh, data is such a great tool for learning math and really applying it for students, getting them engaged in it. So. Uh, I wanted to join into that group. And then as a part of that, they were talking about these TOPS modules. And so we, as a group, decided to go through the TOPS modules together and so become involved in um, a virtual training atmosphere for that, where we're kind of a cohort of people learning together. Fantastic. Kenji, well, it's amazing to have someone who has so much experience with virtual environment training, especially since being a teacher, making that transition during COVID. I'm sure you have a lot of do's and don'ts to share with us all. Next up, and lastly, but certainly not least, we are also joined by James Powell. James is a professional Python programmer, speaker, instructor, and enthusiast. He started working with Python in the finance industry, building reporting and analysis systems for prop trading front offices. He currently works as a consultant, building data engineering and scientific computing platforms for a wide range of clients using cutting edge open source tools like Python and React. And James has led hundreds of virtual trainings and given hundreds of talks for developers and researchers alike to make better use of programming. And so James, can you share with us your experience with virtual training and how you got involved in your field? So I first got involved in training as a field probably about 10 years ago, around 2013 or 2014. And at the time, these were predominantly skills training for scientific computing and scientific research staff. They were also predominantly in person. But of course, as the demands on my time, the demands for these kind of trainings and the realities of how people work and the realities of the last few years came up, over the last five years, almost the entirety of these have trans has transformed into virtual trainings. And if it is the case that we need to deliver the same material with the same effectiveness and the same engagement, we really do need to do things very differently in our virtual setting than what we were comfortable with, what we learned, what we knew, what was just standard practice in in-person trainings. And so it's of great interest for me to discover not only how can we do virtual trainings as well as our previous in-person standard bunch of people in a classroom style, but also what can virtual trainings do that that style cannot do? How can they be even better? Well, James, it's great to have you join us. And I love the angle of not how can we make virtual trainings as effective as, as the classroom, but how can we make virtual trainings more effective than the classroom? So I'm very excited to hear what you have to share with us. With that being said, that rounds out our panel that we have lined up for today. It's amazing to share the stage with all of you, and I'm very excited for today's discussion. Let's jump into the very first question that we have for our panel. And as a reminder, if you are in the audience, you may submit your questions in the Q&A widget and we'll answer them live as we are able to. I'll read out each question that we have and additionally for our audience, I'll share them on my screen. So behind me, you'll see my screen and I'll hide in the corner just so you can see all the text. The first question that we have is under the topic, key challenges in virtual trainings. And so for our panel, I ask you this. What are some of the significant challenges that you've encountered in delivering effective virtual training and how have you overcome them? And so I'll open the floor for our panel. I'll start off and I'll start off with something very controversial. I think that learning is supposed to be difficult, maybe even painful, not in a negative way, but it's supposed to be the case where sometimes you really try and it's difficult and maybe you might even get frustrated. And I think that as a consequence, one of the things that's most important is to get the students to be as active in their learning as possible and as engaged as possible. In an in-person setting, you can do that through various means. For example, even if people sit in the back of the classroom and their heads down the whole time, you can wander around the classroom and do things like that. But in a virtual session where you're not physically present with somebody, it can be very difficult to make sure that they're there, present, active in the session. 
especially since in a lot of our work from home setups, people are extraordinarily distracted, even more so than they were when you could sequester them in an office together. And if it's the case that somebody expects a training to be like putting on a YouTube channel and zoning out, which is very much the mode in which a lot of these Zoom calls and a lot of our meetings operate, it can be the case that these virtual trainings are significantly less effective than an in-person training because you're not even forced to pay attention. You're distracted, you're at home, there's a million things going on. People don't even respect your time as much as when you say, I'm going to the training center and I won't be in the office. And the format is leads to passivity very easily. Question is, how do, what do we do about this? And so one thing that we try to do is to make these even more participatory than the previous in-person trainings, where in in-person trainings, it would often be the case that you would let people participate, speak up as they see fit. In many of our trainings now, we have mandatory participation moderated by a facilitator who then comes in and says something like, you know, if for whatever reason, this is not something that you're comfortable doing, or if you need accommodations, we can sort that out. But we try and get people on audio, we try and rotate through people, we try and talk to every single person that we can, because otherwise it's just way too easy for them to melt into the background and then five hours later, nothing has really been accomplished for them. It's a very fair point. And Kenji, I see you just came off mute. Did you have a, an additional item or your own challenge that you wanted to share? No, I just, um, I, I agree. I think that it's a, it's a major issue, the engagement piece of it. Um, I wanted to bring up, you know, teaching in high school, that's a challenge we have already in the classroom so much is, you know, the engagement and the buy-in there for students. And so going virtually, it was like that much more difficult because you're putting them onto a device where there's an infinite number of possible things that they would much rather be doing on that device than learning from you. And so that engagement piece is, is very important. And I think, um, for other types of virtual trainings too, I think getting that buy-in from people as to why this is important and why you should learn it is, is really important. Um, like I said, in this group that I've been doing, this, this TOPS module group, it's an opt-in thing. We were all a group of people that were interested in data fluency and we all agreed, hey, let's do these TOPS modules. And so it's it helps that it's not something that is a required thing. People are there because they wanna learn about it. And so the buy-in for it and the engagement is really nice. That's not always, possible sometimes you do have to require some things but the more you can do to encourage people and uh, i mean generally in a professional setting you have people that are they want to know what they need to know and so if you can encourage them and and really explain why it's important information and make that valuable to them you know it's not busy work it's not just a box you're having to check off if you can make it uh if you can make it valuable for them then they'll want to learn it And Brian, I see you've come off mute. Did you have an additional item to share there as well? Yeah, just a, you know, a challenge that I think we've been noticing as we bring Open Science 101 to JPL <clears throat> is oftentimes it's not a lack of enthusiasm about the course materials that, you know, leads people to, to not make time for, for taking virtual training. It's really about, you know, their schedule. There's so many demands on people's times these days that they often don't have time to, you know, dedicate, you know, X number of hours to a, a training. <clears throat> So we've started working with individual groups that we want, you know, to to take the training or that have shown interest in taking the training and, you know, to really find a schedule that fits them. So sometimes that might be, you know, some people want to get through the whole training, just do it kind of all at once in, you know, a couple of days or something like that. Other groups, you know, don't have that that dedicated, you know, block of time. So they they've asked, you know, for us to offer classes like once a week, once every other week or something like that. So, you know, it's really one thing we've discovered is that we shouldn't be afraid to try new formats and new schedules, um, especially if, you know, we're having problems getting people, you know, into the classroom just because of, of scheduling issues. Well, That's a very fair point. Sorry. And Jessica, go, go right ahead. No, I was going to say that something that um, we started doing and for people that maybe they want to join in in front of me, but they find it difficult sometimes, not maybe every meeting, but some of them, if they're parents, if they're taking care of someone, if they are in a different time zone or whatever, um, we record the sessions and we upload them and share the materials. And we try to make uh, another space available for them to participate and interact with their peers because we think that is important for them to be engaged interaction. So, 
we really um, encouraged the use of Slack. We created a Slack channel for each session and people can bring their doubts, their experiences. Uh, something that Brian, I think, mentioned is, uh, and also Kenji, most of the people that participate in this kind of virtual training are usually interested in the subject and they have experience in research and maybe they have experience in open science. And I think that being able to share that with colleagues, peers, is something that also helps uh, increase engagement. So even though you run the risk that not many people join because you're recording everything, I think it has the value, the added value that you're also making this accessible for people that for any reason they cannot join. I think that's a very fair point. And sometimes sweetening the pot of um, the attending live helps out with that. But before we move to our next question, we did have one question from the audience. And James, I actually saw you just came off mute. Did you have an additional thought to share on that topic? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear from Jessica because we, off, we also record these sessions. We also think about how to provide materials under other cover. But one thing that I worry about sometimes is very well-meaning individuals will say, okay, can I look at the recording? They'll want to look at the recording. They'll, in their hearts, really want to find that time, but they don't. I know I've done that before with meetings or with sessions. I download the recording. I tell myself I'll look at it on Friday, but just other things intervene. And this experience leads me to think that sometimes we have to create the circumstances that force the prioritization. And so the liveness of the session is about kind of forcing somebody, you know what? There's a million things going on. You have to make a decision. You make a decision for this. When you strategize those alternate ways to make this accessible to somebody, how do you also not undercut yourself so that it makes it too easy for them to very meaningfully say, well, I won't do this, but then something intervenes and they just kind of, it just slips. Okay, I think Cameron said something about that. It's swinging in the pot of participating live and also of looking at the recording, I think. So for example, um, we had a pilot cohort at the beginning of the year, and we were using the, the OS 101 material, and they were in English, and they were all with examples from the United States, and we used them to teach these contents in Spanish to people that are not really maybe as invested in those examples that are in the modules. So, what we did is we brought people, even the same participants that already had experience, we started bringing up how this applies to Latin America. What examples can we bring? Uh, can we apply everything? Do we have to change it? Do we have to adapt it? And the people participated very actively and the discussion continued in the chat, in the Slack story. And even the um, we had surveys at the end of the, the training, and one of the things that came out is that people valued mostly the discussion around how to implement this in Latin America, and they wanted more time to do that. So people that could not join every week, they still looked at the recordings and made comments about it in the chat, in the Slack story. <laughs> Fantastic. So that live interaction is still valuable. So I think one thing for virtual trainings is not to run it the same way like you were doing a recorded video, but instead to definitely bring in some interactive or some live components to sweeten that pot. Now we do have a follow up question along the lines of this topic, some previous discussion that we've had. And I believe Kenji, you might be the best fit for this question, but of course, we'll open this for all of our panelists. What kind of teacher training would you recommend to make the transition from in-person to virtual letter online training? We find that uh, this individual found that the skill set needed for online training is quite different than that of an in-person training. And so, Kenji, I'm curious, did you have to change the style in which you led classroom discussion from in-person to virtual? Uh, yes, you do have to change it. I it, I do think it takes um, some different skills. I wouldn't say that it's a completely different set of skills. I think it's just an adjustment of those skills. Like it, being a teacher in a classroom, you need to be aware of um, 
kind of what people are getting from it, how engaging it is, how to uh, pull people in, get them interested in it and, and interacting with it. There's those still same skills are there. It's just different because now you're doing it virtually. So how do you measure engagement? Um, if you're requiring all the cameras to be on, you know, are you seeing the nodding of heads or whatever? Are you noticing that they're just distracted doing something different? Those types of pieces work for uh, in-person discussion. It's the same thing as teaching in person. It's just, you have to refine how you're measuring that engagement. Um, as far as what kind of training in particular, I found that the most valuable thing for me was just to um, really explore what other people were doing. I mean, it, as hard as it was to transition to online teaching um, from being in the classroom, everybody was doing it. So there were a million different ideas being thrown out there in how to do it. And so, you, you know, you try by doing. And so my training really just came from experimentation and, and trying that out, see what worked with other people. And now a lot of people have refined different skills for that. So um, I don't know of like a specific like, oh, here's a good professional development training you should do to, to learn how to do that. But I will say there are, um, I mean, countless number of uh, teacher influencers or YouTube channels dedicated to properly training online that are really good resources um, and learning how to how to engage with people that way. I think that it's just like was stated at the beginning, it's just important that you're not, you're not just taking this lesson and putting it online. You're utilizing the methods that are available to you as being online. I, I, I think people, a lot of people were like, oh, I don't like teaching online. It's, it's worse than teaching in person. It's, well, it's different. You can accomplish different things doing it online. I mean, you can reach a wider audience you can have different schedules, like you can um, have really cool interactive things, very low cost, where you wouldn't be able to do those things. Um, I mean, you can travel to places <laughs> virtually. There, there's lots of different ways that online learning can be a benefit. And if you if you utilize those things, like I said, I think I think it's a similar set of skills. It's just refining them a little bit. Absolutely, I agree with you there, Kenji. I find one other thing is that you have to dial the enthusiasm up to almost a theatrical or performative uh, perspective. And so you really, cause in person, you know, you're this moving figure in the front of a classroom and people can focus in on that very easily without any distractors. And on virtual, as we've discussed, there's so many competing things for your attention. And so any benefit that you can have to be the, the shiniest or the most interesting object in the room is gonna work to your advantage. <laughs> and. and to go with that too, I think that, um, I think that picking out the best pieces because you're competing for attention too is like um, anything. Try to get rid of the extra. Uh, I mean, you want to try to get this is what's necessary and this is what's interesting, and engaging, and and really getting that out. I think that the extra stuff is great and it's great practice and it's great things to expand upon. But if you're trying to keep people's attention for a short amount of time get it down to the bare bones. This is what's necessary. This is how we're going to get them into the information, what they need to know. And then you can build on that afterwards. Um, in the classroom, I think you have a little more freedom to do some of that. But I mean, as you know, like as teachers would know too, it's the same skill. You should know not to do too much busy work because students will know that it's busy work and what's the point of doing it? It's not valuable to their time. Absolutely, Kenji. Now I saw James come off audio and then Jessica. So we'll go in that order. Uh, Kenji, I wonder in your experience, do the additional accommodations that are uniquely possible in a virtual setting actually play out? For example, you can add captions really easily. Um, if people can't see a chalkboard, they can very easily see a picture in picture view that you have or a screenshot that you have. If people have some distraction related issues where they're very easily distracted, maybe sitting in a quieter room with just one person speaking is easier than having the noise of a classroom behind them. Does it actually play out in practice or is this still more challenging than in person? I, I have found um, that it does play out in, in generally, if you're doing it well, um, if you make sure you are using platforms that use those accommodations and you're, and you're um, utilizing them properly for your audience, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I found, I ended up doing uh, flipping my classroom. Uh, and I did that actually pre-pandemic and then it just transitioned really well into the pandemic. So I had my lectures recorded but then we would discuss the questions and work through the homework together as a group and, and individually and that sort of thing in class. And so um, one of the things I found really beneficial to that 
And so students that got distracted or had really tr had trouble taking notes, they just get to rewatch those parts of the lecture. You know, I made the lecture short because I wanted them to be, this is the information that's needed. Any questions that we need to dive in further, I'm, that's why I'm there. So you can ask those questions. Um, there's really cool resources online. I don't, I'm sure there's plenty of other ones now, but I was using Edpuzzle where you could do your, like these recorded lectures, but then you could prompt with questions as it went through too. So you're like making sure that they're not just playing, pressing play and they're just letting it go in the background kind of thing. Um, but then having those discussions and engagement to follow those things up, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a 40 minute lecture that they just watched and then just turned in homework. It was like, okay, here's an essential 10 minutes or five minutes even, and then and then we'll address questions and work on some questions together to prompt those things. So um, in that sense, I really found that that thing was really accommodating for some students in particular um, that struggled with attention. It's like, okay, here's, here's, I need to watch this thing. And if I didn't understand something, I could go back and I'm not taking everybody else's class time in that too. They could watch those sections and they could refer to it while they're doing their homework too, which was nice. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then Jessica, I know you had one more thought before we wrapped up with this question. Yes, I was thinking that um, about what uh, Kenzie said, uh, that it is, I, I, I do recommend keeping the cognitive load to the minimum. So I think that one should not abuse like very technological tools that may generate an additional distraction sometimes, but uh, short quizzes every 20 minutes or every number of uh, concepts, something that, that you can also use to measure engagement because you can see how many people answered, uh, how many answered correctly, you know if I, you can move forward or if you have to revisit some um, concepts. I think that those are very, very helpful. And also, Kenji, I think that the, the idea with the, with the short videos and the questions in the middle sounds great for someone with problems with attention. I think I would benefit from it, so thank you. Fantastic. Well, that evens out some of the challenges that we've encountered. So let's move on to our next discussion question. This topic is all about innovative approaches, approaches and techniques. Now, I know we've discussed some of the new techniques that each of us have employed as part of overcoming challenges, but I'm curious if there are other innovative methods or technologies that you have implemented in your virtual trainings to enhance learner engagement and outcomes. And so I know, Brian, you said that you recently are fine tuning kind of your audience that you're delivering some of the open science training material to. I'm curious if there's any other technological changes that you're using here. As part of your delivery? Um, not so much in terms of our delivery. Actually, you know, for Open Science 101 in general, I think we've tried to keep it pretty simple and pretty open in terms of how we deliver it. For example, you know, we have the online training, which is just, you know, available through a, a basic website. And I, I think we've tried to, to keep it simple um, because we don't want technology to be a barrier for people. So, you know, we want to use really common and documented and, and well-known tools so that people don't have to go, you know, download something and then, you know, they get tripped up on installing it. Um, <clears throat> you really want to make sure that your apps are, are commonly used. Uh, maybe they even have a browser version for people who can't download tools um, and things like that. And if you're, you know, trying to use uh, tools in within the training, you know, for example, like a virtual whiteboard or something, you kind of want to have those low barriers too. And you know, in, in terms of barriers, you also want to make sure that people can easily find your tools, that they can sign up for them. You don't want, you know, them to come up with IT security issues or, or privacy issues. Um, so that's why I think that, you know, trying to keep your, the, you know, kind of technology load or, or balance to, uh, you know, keeping it simple is probably the best way to go. And I think that's where we've had a lot of success in delivering Open Science 101, you know, online and, you know, eventually virtually as well. Fantastic. Are there any other innovative methods? I think keeping it simple and keeping it accessible is a great, great thing to do, especially for virtual trainings, where we are in learning a lot of new technologies like the Open Science 101 curriculum. Kenji. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, like, I, I totally agree. I think keeping it simple and, and accessible is, is the key as far as going forward. Um, there are some really cool niche cases where, like, advanced technology options are are becoming more and more 
interesting for very specific cases. Like I was saying, like digital for, uh, or virtual field trips. I think that's like, you can go a little more in depth and do some really cool things like that. And virtual learning, like it works for even just an in-person class. If you don't have the ability to go to, um, you know, some location, a volcano or whatever, to just study the geology of it. There's some really cool tools online. Um, Infiniscope, I want to plug a little bit, science, uh, SciAct uh, project, but Infiniscope is a really great one uh, where teachers can go for free and they have access to this material to create virtual field trips where they can have interactive lessons and stuff. It's pretty low load for the learners. Like um, they go in and they just click and and go through it. Uh, it takes a little bit to learn how to do it as a teacher. It's not terribly difficult to learn, but um, definitely a really cool tool where you can take advantage of the fact that it's virtual and go places that you wouldn't normally have access to. And it's really interactive too. So um, I think it's low load on the students or, or whoever learners you have, um, but you can do some pretty powerful things with it. James, did you have some thoughts on top of that? Yeah, I have a follow up for Brian, which is you mentioned the simplicity of the tools. Is that also mean that consolidated tools are better than non consolidated tools? Because my thought is that very complex tools give attendees an opportunity to wander. They can't quite get something working and then it leads to distraction. Whereas consolidated simplified tools, it's right there, right in front of you, which means if you had, say, a platform and it didn't have some functionality, is it better? to just go without that functionality than to split somebody's attention between use this for this and this for this. Like if OS 101's MOOC was missing something, is it better to just say, look, live with what's inside there because there's too much of a risk of wandering? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's a good question. I think, yeah, you want to avoid the risk of, of wandering. You want to have a tool that meets as many as your needs as possible. I mean, I doubt that you'll find a tool that meets all, you know, 100% of your needs, but I would recommend going with the one that meets, you know, the most of your needs. And then, you know, just keeping people just, you know, kind of in one place, kind of focused on one thing, I, I think it goes a long way. So that's why I would definitely recommend, you know, a consolidated tool. And I think for OS 101, I, I think we've, we have that with the, the online training, the MOOC, um, you know, where people can go through, they can, you know, look at the training materials, they can do the assessment questions, you know, sometimes there's links to external materials, but you know, that's, you know, pretty common. So I, I think keeping people in one place is, is really, would be my suggestion for the way to go. And for OS 101, how do you avoid account signup fatigue? Because you want the OS 101, they have to sign up for an account there. Then there may be a Slack channel, you sign up for an account there, and then you might have some call, which might be on another platform. How do you avoid the fatigue from, okay, now I have 16 accounts to do a five hour training? Yes. Well, I have more than 16 in my own life, <laughs> but trying to keep track of those is pretty terrible. Um, but so, you know, just talking about the Open Science um, 101 online platform, we use, uh, we have an option at least for some sort of single sign on with ORCID. So, you know, if you already have an ORCID account, then you can use that account to sign in. So you can use, a, you know, like Google accounts or Facebook accounts, you know, to, to sign into a website. So that kind of eliminates, you know, having that other password. Um, but then a lot of our other stuff is opt-in. Like if they want, they don't, you don't have to join the Slack channel to do Open Science 101. You don't have to, you know, get on, you know, calls or, or sign up for newsletters. So I think having that stuff that's external to the, the training platform, that's optional is fine. But, you know, if you just want them to focus on the training, you know, you should have just a, some sort of way that they can easily log on, you know, perhaps with existing credentials. And I, I that's probably helpful to them. I know it's helpful to me. Excellent. So sometimes there are too many accounts and it's important to really dial it down to the bare bones of what you actually need to complete the training. Are there any other thoughts on this question from Kenji or Jessica about innovative methods or technologies that you've implemented? All right, then with that in mind, why don't we jump into our next question? This topic is about the impact of open science. So this will be an open science specific question. How has the push towards open science influenced your approach to virtual training? What are the benefits and challenges that you have observed? I can start. Yeah. Um, so 
You know, I think I've mentioned before that there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm around open science. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to get uh, with the open science 101 tr uh, training materials is for, you know, people to feel like they're included in this. So you do that by, you know, building a community, um, even around the training and kind of making that training a, a community owned product. So to do that, um, you know, we've made Open Science 101, you know, completely citable so that, you know, you can see who's developed it, you know, kind of where it came from. Um, and we've also put the training materials into GitHub so that people can uh, suggest changes to it so that people can, you know, discuss it. Um, and that that's really kind of, you know, the essence of Open Science. Um, and then they can go take those materials and, you know, obviously take them themselves, which is what we encourage. But, you know, folks can pull from that, those resources and then, you know, use that in their own trainings, which is, is really great, you know, so they can um, suggest changes, the community can discuss them. So the community really feels like they have ownership over that. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's definitely within the vein and, and kind of ethos of open science. So I, I think that's, you know, been really great for, for the open science 101 training materials. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, incorporating technologies that they need to learn about in the lesson itself. Awesome <laughs> idea there. Exactly. And Jessica, did you have something to add on top of this? Yes, I was going to mention that in Metaosensia, we had a similar experience. Um, all our courses, we uh, put them in Senodo, and you have a DOI uh, if you want to cite them and reuse them. Everything is available. Um, you can post an issue if you need to change that. And I think the fact that people start to feel part of what we're doing, part of the community, it also helps with engagement, which we were talking before with the pilot cohort at the beginning of the year. Uh, we have the experience that people like, I don't wanna say lingered because it sounds wrong. I, I need my Spanish here. Uh, people stayed active in the Slack, for example, and it started participating in the con contextualization of the materials, in the signing of teaching materials for the next cohort, in providing case studies. Like, uh, it was it was great. And it also helped, I think, for them completing the initial uh, training. I think for uh, teachers, it's great that this push for open science um, is because the access to um, data, access to these studies, access to software, anything that's open um, and free and easy to access for teachers makes it that much easier for us to integrate it into our classrooms. And so uh, we can get students involved in these things a lot earlier. And I think that's amazing. Um, I think for data sets, especially one of the things is there might be data sets that are technically available, but that whole like, actually accessible and usable pieces of those, um, the more that people are pushing to those, the easier it is for a teacher who's not a research scientist to be able to access that data and use it in a classroom. Um, I think that's that's been really cool, especially for me as a math teacher who's like, there's a big push right now in math for data science being influenced into all levels of math education. And I mean, I taught statistics too, and it's just nice to be able to have real life data that's easy to get to and easy to use in a classroom. Absolutely. So the reproducibility aspect, you know, blends into the classroom quite nicely. Any final thoughts on this question? Or shall we move on to the next panel discussion question? I have one thought, which is to present a very significant challenge that the OS 101 materials present us in this particular virtual training format, which is the OS 101 materials are largely conceptual materials. This is why open ethics matters. This is why version control matters. And it's been my experience that that is very challenging to present, except in this format, because it's largely seminar or lecture material. You have to put a lot of work to then find the participatory aspect of it, to shift those materials to be more discussion-based. And in some cases with some audiences, it can be very difficult to formulate an activity or discussion because they may be so early in their career, they can't speak that authoritatively to the challenges of scientific research if maybe they're just a first year postdoc. As a consequence, I've tried to put a little bit more, and Cameron and I have tried to put a little bit more skills-based material here. 
or things which we know you need to get out of the way. Because in a virtual setting, showing somebody how to do something oftentimes gets better engagement than just showing somebody why is something important, which, as we found, leads to passivity much easier because it, it lends itself too well to a seminar format, but it's very difficult to get in other formats. Agreed there. Kenji, Jessica, Brian, any additional thoughts as to on what James just mentioned? Nothing specific. I mean, you know, we, I think Open Science 101 was designed to be an introductory uh, course. So, you know, but obviously an introduction to, you know, open science means different things to different audiences. So I think it's it's great to be, you know, conscious of who your audience is. Um, and that's the great thing about having Open Science 101 open is that you can take it and download it. And, you know, so long as you're hitting those learning objectives, you know, you can customize it if you need to um, with examples, um, kind of like Jessica was talking about, you know, include relevant examples for your audience. Um, if there's materials in there that you think that your audience has a good handle on, you know, maybe that's something you just don't, you know, you as an instructor decide not to discuss. Um, but, you know, each module in Open Science 101 comes with learning objectives. So I think that as long as you're hitting those and that, you know, people can pass assessment tests at the end, I think, you know, you're in good shape. Excellent. And Brian, there's actually a question for you about technologies. The question says, there are a lot of students and individuals who find it challenging to work with technology in regards to TOPS. Should there be a pre-technology or prerequisites for those planning to attend TOPS? Um, I, I think I, I think it would actually that's a good idea to include some, you know, kind of maybe update our README if that information is not already there as to what you know the requirements would be for getting on to the system, you know, I, I'm sure there are browser requirements, you know, since we live in the modern age where security, you know, patches are coming out pretty quickly. Um, but that's, that's definitely something to consider. Um, I'll, I'll have to look into that more with the tops team. I building on that point there, Brian, I've found that delivering these to a wide range of researchers, you know, from in, new grad students all the way to postdocs, PIs, or even more so kind of developers that support researchers. I found that when we talk about the importance of things like version control, if I show them an example of how to use Git, the new grad student audience gets very overwhelmed. They're, they're you know, they haven't really programmed that much in their life. And so they think, whoa, this is, this is all very confusing. And so at least what I try and do from the OS 101 perspective is emphasize why is this important and show them a little bit of the features as to what I think is important from a research perspective as well. And so that way I'm not saying you need to learn this right now, but I'm saying here's why this is important in the first place. And then of course, if you wanna learn the nuts and bolts of this, join us for you know an open science skills or more applied session. No, I, I think that's that's the right approach. I mean, you know, I would, if, if it's an audience that's not familiar with programming or that's, um, you know, kind of, kind of even new to open science, um, I, I think it would it's great to introduce introduce them conceptually to the idea of version control, um, because you know you don't necessarily have to take a deep dive into Git, you know, right from the right from the introduction to version control, right? I mean, there are other ways and other programs to do version control. Um, you know, version control is also an important concept for, for other aspects of open science too, like, like data and version control. So I think that hitting what is version control, why should I do it, how should I do it, how does it benefit me, um, is, uh, would be the right approach for an introductory class. And then, you know, to follow on with resources and links to other classes or YouTube videos or, or some other materials after that would be, would be great. Fantastic. I, I love the idea of distributing videos that are relevant to the applied versions of the skills. And that way you can cover the conceptual stuff as the instructor. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for your thoughtful responses on this topic. Let's jump to our next question about engagement and motivation. As we identified during our challenges question, engaging with an audience can be hard. So how do you maintain high levels of engagement and motivation among participants during virtual training sessions, especially in extended or complex topics. I know that a two day virtual training session, you're almost always gonna see drop off between, from the first day going to the second day. So I'm curious how you all tackle that in your own trainings. Uh, 
I can I can start us off with what um, I think I've with the group that I'm doing uh, this with right now. Um, it helps that it's it's an opt in process. I mean, they're choosing to be there. We're doing an hour once a month. It's really spread out, and so they're dedicating that time. They want to learn this information. I mean, it's kind of the ideal situation for us because everybody that's there is wanting to be there. It's not a huge time commitment, so it's not a huge drain. It's generally people are left wanting more after that hour, but then we, you know we go to the next one. So, um, <laughs> not everybody. It's not always conducive to that, though. You can't do that sometimes. Some people you have to do things within a timely manner. So I think going back to what we talked about with some of the challenges, it's if you can keep things relevant, um, make sure that they're understanding why it's important, and um, I mean. It's, this is not a new thing for just virtual training sessions in a classroom. If you do a two day training, people are going to get exhausted and, and check out. So it's not exclusive to virtual. It's just um, there's more distractions with virtual training, I think. And like we said, too, um, I think James was saying, too, it's like um, sometimes people don't value your time if they're if you're not going on site to something like they might send you requests or something. It's like, well, no, I'm in a training. Well, it's just a virtual training. So they don't respect that it, or the people themselves don't. They double book themselves because they're like, well, I'm just in this virtual training. I can be doing something else. So as much as you can avoid those long multi-day sessions, I think that's probably one of the better ways to go because like I said, even not in virtual trainings, trying to do that is um, it, you're going to lose participation anyway. So um, if you can I can space it out a little bit like that, keep things engaging. I think also uh, leaning in on the discussion piece of it a lot. You can do a little bit of information or a lecture or whatever you have to do for that, but then really engaging in the discussion. People are willing to engage and spend more time doing that uh, generally. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea for, uh, especially for the flipped classroom when it's applicable there. One thing that I know we try and weave into our uh, virtual trainings is a narrative. And we think of you know virtual trainings, if you want them to be educational and a little bit of entertainment, right, to keep engaged in motivation. But if you can wrap in a very nice and coherent narrative that gives you the ability, especially for a multi-day thing, to leave your audience on a cliffhanger. And so what gets you back to that next episode of television is not knowing what comes next, but also being aware that something interesting comes next. So crafting, it, that's the very polished type of presentation, but if you can craft that narrative in there, I think it's especially impactful. Which I would just like to also say, uh, which I don't know that I said this before, but the way that we're doing our TOPS modules is um, essentially a flipped classroom setup too, where people do the modules and then we discuss questions and mm -hmm. things from them. So that's the same way that we're doing that way. And it's, like I said, it's a shorter amount of time, not very often, but I think that if you had to compact that, it still would be a good option. Um, reducing the total amount of time you'd be there because it's like, well, just do this on your own time and then we will have this really rich, enriching discussion about it. And that will be something that people will want to come to. Yeah. And now Jessica, I saw you came off audio. Did you have some thoughts on this topic? Uh, yeah. If I... I agree with Kenzie that if you can amplify the discussion part of the session, that will make people feel more engaged. Um, mostly er, anything that will make them be more active, exercises, breakout rooms, uh, whatever they can, that we can make for them to be, to have to do something. So they cannot check out, like uh, turn off the, the turn off the camera and just do something else. That they have to be there present to be able to follow everything, I think it helps. And I also think it makes it more entertaining. Uh, it's been me, my experience. I've been teaching programming to people that do not want to learn to, how to program and are not very interested in it, in it, but need it for some reason. For example, PhD students in psychology, they do not want it, they hate it. And um, what I found is that if you can make it relevant, like in this test, and you can, you know, keep keep it active all the time, they will participate. It will become entertaining. They will complain out loud, and that will make them be there. So I think that can help. 
I like that a lot. Even anything that gets them interacting with the material is better than passive. And being, we all know, being an active learner is so, so important to understanding the material. And in my research, Jessica, um, I'm sure you can relate uh, studying both long-term and working memory. The memory tricks that we have in memory literature are not that interesting. But the best way to learn something is to make sure you paid attention when you were first learning it. That's one of the best things you can do to mem uh, form a memory, right? You can't form memory if you never encoded it in the first place. All right, then James, oh, did you have one more thought to share on this topic, James? There is some latent motivation that is lurking behind much of the OS 101 materials. Because lurking behind that is the reality that scientific research and industrial process have aligned significantly over the last couple of years. Is it inappropriate to tap into that latent motivation and to tell attendees, by the way, open data sets, open source software, open results. These are all things that you'll also do if you happen to leave academia behind forever and go get a job in the real world. Is it okay, is it appropriate for us to kind of whisper that in their ears to get their motivation tapped in, even though it's kind of working against the processes of having you know, more people do better scientific research, showing them this is what it looks like if you see the exit door? I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, one of the things we talk about, I think, in one of the, the Open Science 101 modules is that, you know, you're your best future collaborator, right? Um, you don't know how long you're going to be at an institution, you know, whether you go to industry, whether you go to a, a university, a, any federal, you know, agency, you don't know, you know, always when you're, what your career path will, will look like. So, you know, one of the motivations to making things open is to put it out there so that you can, you know, find and, and reference your own work and, and build upon that in the future. Excellent. I love that, Brian. If we, if we can quote that and frame it, you are your best collaborator. Awesome. All right. Let's jump to our next question that we have in store, and we'll wrap on this question as well. The topic for this question is adapting to diverse learning styles. Virtual training often involves participants with different learning styles and different backgrounds. How do you adapt your training methods to cater to this type of diversity? And building on this, we actually have a comment in the chat. Each group or each cohort that you work with is different. And I think in virtual training, we see a much higher rate of turnover of groups for classrooms than we would in an in-person environment, especially in an academic environment where sometimes you'll work with the same group of students for nine weeks or 10 weeks. Typically virtual training sessions are not that uh, long lasted. So I'm curious how you all translate from one group to the next group while maintaining the same set of results when all the individuals you're working with are going to be quite different. Um, I was going to say this is, a, I mean, this is the major question for education. It's how do we, one size fits all doesn't not work. Um, so you have to adapt and you have the benefit in a classroom to learn those connections like you just said. You have them for whatever, a semester, nine weeks, you have them for a quarter, whatever you have them for, um, to learn those methods and, and really adapt that. And for these online training things, I think there's a couple of different options of things. Um, one, in our case, we have a community built around something already, like we're data fluency group that people were wanting to join and then we agreed on doing this thing. So there's different diversity and different backgrounds, but we're learning the information and then discussing those things together because we have a common goal. So those backgrounds help inform that common goal. I think the difficulty is when you have different goals, um, then the learning, it's hard to know how to adapt the learning to, to fit that exactly in, in some cases. Um, and so knowing what that goal is for each learner is going to be, I think, important. Um, one of the questions that's, I, that we had, you know, we're, we're talking about in here that uh, I don't think we're going to have time to get to, but was about new technologies. And, and one of the advancements with AI is that ability to adapt learning to individuals or uh, adapt um, and, and, and experience to an individual. And so I think that that's something that we're going to see more of as we go through these things is that you'll have learning environments um, 
catered specifically to each individual and, and what they what they have coming from their background and so or being able to adjust something to say like hey this is something that we think this would be a better way to present this information to you specifically um it's not quite there yet but i think that we are getting in that direction and so i'm interested to see how that works out it's a fantastic example right incorporating ai so that you can kind of make um individualized learning i know that for for very high touch kind of individual learnings you'll you often work on like an individual learning plan and in ilp and so that is something where you can align the outcomes of the instructor with the attendees and something i find very helpful in especially um, a training of adults or adult students is acknowledging that everyone in that classroom is an expert at something and getting them to participate and relate to the material by sharing on their background. Oftentimes that can spark a discussion that would not have happened otherwise if the instructor had just taken the spotlight the entire time. I can say one of my favorite college classes I ever took was psychology of uh, policy. And in that classroom, we actually had a retired police officer and a recovered uh, heroin addict. And the classroom was set up to be discussion based. And we had some of the best and most interesting discussions that I've ever been a part of. But any final thoughts here on virtual training, learning styles and student backgrounds? Well, um, this sounds very uh, basic compared to what you both mentioned, but uh, given that we don't have contact with the participants for long uh, for a long period of time like we would in the in-person training um, something we can do is actually ask beforehand like in the sign up form uh, the question some questions that can help us have a better idea better understanding of who will be our audience for example, for the next cohort we're launching, we found out that most of the people that are going to participate have quite a lot of experience in open science practices. And that has moderated a bit how we put the classes together. And um, we also ask if, for example, if you have a special requirement regarding accessibility or uh, something, and it came out that there's people that need uh, for example, they need the videos available because they have a particular, they are neurodivergent and they need to have the materials in a different format. So they ask for to have this so they can adapt it. Um, so it gives us tools to work with that. And Brian, I saw you come off uh, mute first and then Kenji. All right, Kenji. Uh, just uh, one quick add on to to what Jessica was saying, you know, with I, I, yeah, asking for information and giving the learners information ahead of time is great. I would also add in, you know, you might want to distribute, uh, for example, your code of conduct for your classes, too, so that people know the parameters, um, you know, that are that the class is going to be taught under and, you know, kind of what's expected of them during that as well. Fantastic. And then Kenji, any final thoughts here on this yeah. topic? I just, um, when Jessica was talking about that, it reminded me that our group, we have that common goal, data fluency, and, and that's a piece of it, but we have noticed that there's a wide range of different learning styles, different uh, skill levels with open science and different general, like the goals is, is promoted data fluency, but for what purpose? And so we, um, we, when we go into our discussion sometimes, sometimes we'll break into groups specifically centered around specific topics and so that's one way too is like you can have broad discussions with everybody but you can also break into smaller discussions if you have a big enough group into like hey we we have people here specifically focused on creating data or sharing data or um, using data or we have specific groups specific on education or this is so there's a way within a group too to even break into smaller groups to have those um you know those backgrounds help mesh together and then bring those ideas to the larger group as well so they can bounce ideas off that um, may be more relevant to them. Yeah, I think the, the small groups is a great idea, especially because it builds connections across the learners. If you're doing like a training at a, in a single institution, you'd be surprised at the fractured departments and things that exist where people who you think should know one another actually have no idea the other person exists. So I ran an Open Science 101 training and I actually put 
about 30 people in touch with the librarian at that institution who had no idea that this person was an, a resource that could, they could access and use. So it's a fantastic idea to help develop or foster those relationships. But on that note, I see we are just at the end of our time that we have allotted, and that takes our panel discussion to a close. I'd like to have a huge virtual round of applause for our panelists and for everyone in our audience. If you would like to hear more about upcoming community events and open science training opportunities, then you should absolutely check out opensciencetraining.org, the link to which has already been posted in the chat. I want to thank everyone in our audience for attending and asking some fantastic questions, driving some great discussion. This has been Open Science Talks, and we hope to see you again at a future community event. Thanks, everyone. <music>